Welcome to episode four of the Haskell Cast. I'm Rain Henricks. My co-host is Chris Forno. Hello. And our guest today is Simon Marlowe. Simon, thank you for joining us. Hi there. I'm, I'm Thanks sure, for having me on. Yeah, we're, we're we're both really excited to have you. We've we've been watching your move to to Facebook with some interest, and we, I think we've both read your new book, Parallel and Concurrent Programming. Uh, with Haskell available in fine bookstores everywhere. So we thought maybe first, <laughs> we thought first we'd talk about uh, your move to Facebook and what you're doing with Haskell there. Um, but I'm, I'm really interested in how did that happen? Did Facebook reach out to you and say, we want to do Haskell? What's the origin story there? Um, so I'd been at Microsoft Research for quite a long time, 14 years at that point. Um, and I sort of felt it was time for a change. So I looked around for something else that I might do. And uh, I happened to be in touch with Brian, Brian O'Sullivan at Facebook. And uh, he sort of encouraged me to join the company. And I uh, went over there and, and learned about the sort of culture inside Facebook and, uh, and found that it's actually a really interesting company. So they, they have quite an open engineering culture. Um, and they, they use whatever technology makes sense. And Brian had done quite a lot of evangelizing of Haskell inside Facebook at that point. Uh, he'd run a course on Haskell, and it was very well attended. Um, so they were very open to the idea of uh, of hiring people who were good at languages and and you know maybe doing some uh, Haskell specifically. So it, it was in some ways a gamble because I didn't know whether joining the company I'd be able to find something useful to do with Haskell or uh, language technology or runtime technology. Um, but I, I took the gamble. I, I really wanted to see whether we could use Haskell in an industrial setting and really make it work. Uh, so, so that's what I did. And I joined the company. I looked around for um, projects that I might use Haskell on, uh, or other projects I might usefully contribute to. Um, I sort of came across this uh, language called FXL, which is a sort of internal proto, uh, well, an internal. Um, uh, DSL really for uh, uh, that's used by the the team that fights spam at Facebook, and it's a functional language. So they use this language called FXL for writing rules that that match on certain types of content on the site, uh, and this sort of rule base is constantly evolving and changing, and uh, and and this is how the spam is detected and malware and various other types of undesirable content on the site. Um, so it turns out that FXL is a it was modeled somewhat on ML, but it has a, a laziness aspect to it as well, and it's strongly typed, which made it for sort of very interesting from my point of view. And I uh, contacted the team that were working on this and said, well, you know, maybe we should we use Haskell at all? Is there any benefit in using Haskell? And, uh, and they were very keen on this from, from the outset. Um, there was really no selling to do at all. They were already sold on the idea. <laughs> and. Uh, so then we started working on it, and so it turns out FXL is, is a very limited language. It doesn't have any user-definable data types or anything like that. Um, it, all the data is in strings or ints or JSON and, and vectors and maps and so on. Um, and it, the, the language is very limited in expressivity and, and the kind of abstractions that you can build. Basically, no abstractions. It's, it's all just a DSL that you can program in. Um, so the advantage of bringing Haskell in is that we can build more interesting APIs and libraries and so on for the programmers that use this language to use. And also we get the benefits of, uh, of compiling because FXL is an interpreted language. Um, but so the, the sticking point was that uh, FXL has two killer features. One of them is that it has a sort of implicit concurrency aspect to it. If you write an expression that, that uh, fetches data from multiple sources, this is the job of the language. It has to fetch data from lots of different services inside Facebook. Um, and it does this concurrently. So the, the interpreter that runs the FXL expression kind of walks over the expression, finds all the data that needs to be fetched, and fetches it all in one, all in one go, all at once. Uh, and obviously, that's much more efficient than finding the first data fetch and, and fetching the data back, and then going to find the next bit, and so on. Um, so this was its, its main killer feature. And then it has automatic memoization as well. 
which is quite interesting because it means that you don't have to worry about things like common sub-expression and elimination. Um, and there's lots of that kind of thing goes on in the code that people write. Um, so we had to figure out how to design a DSL in Haskell that, that replicates this. The implicit concurrency feature was really the main problem. Um, so I sort of worked for a long time to try and find a good monad or some kind of abstraction that would replicate this functionality. And what I found in the end was, after trying various things, that having a concurrency monad and then uh, adding a new twist to the idea of the concurrency monad, which is an applicative instance. And the applicative instance is where the implicit concurrency comes in, because in an applicative composition, you can, uh, you can explore down both branches of the composition and find, in our case, blocked data fetches, and then you know, propagate those up. Uh, and in that way, you can, you can explore lots of the computation and collect all the data fetches up together and submit them all as a single batch. So that gave us a solution to this problem. So we can write expressions using applicative and collect all our data fetches up in one go uh, and submit them all in uh, as a single batch. And then once that's done, once you've got the data, you can then plug it back into the expression, then explore more of the expression. Uh, and the, the, the whole computation sort of proceeds in a series of rounds where you do one round of data fetching and then you do some more computation, then some more data fetching and so on. Um, so the the runtime there then is is building some sort of graph of computation that the model's dependencies between you know data dependencies then and the applicative instance allows you to examine more of the the graph at runtime is is that the advantage that you got yeah yeah so the um in the FXL implementation, there really was a graph in the memory of the system. So the interpreter really built a graph of the computation and explored it and filled in bits after the data was available. Uh, in the Haskell implementation, we're just really reifying the bare minimum of the data um, structure that needs to be exposed. And, and that's the structure of the applicative, uh, the applicative computation that you've got. So that's the structure that gets explored. And it's not it's not explicit in any sense, apart from the fact that you've just got these applicative compositions going on. OK, so you're not building a data structure to represent the, the dependencies behind the scenes. You're using Haskell's laziness in a way, then, or, or not? Uh, well, it's, it, it's really in the structure of the, of the applicative composition. So you can have that thing build a data structure underneath, and that's one of the, the solutions that we explored. But you don't have to build that data structure. You can just execute it directly. Uh, and that's what we're doing right now. So there may be some benefit in building a data structure instead, and that may let us do some kind of on-the-fly optimization or something like that. Uh, maybe we'll explore that in the future. But right now, just executing it directly just solves the problem nicely. Okay. Yeah, this, this um, I guess, is an interesting instance of the benefit of using something sort of less expressive. If you, if you did this in a monad, then the problem is the dependency on uh, prior steps in the computation, right? Where when you do it as uh, an applicative, uh, you, can, you can sort of execute these things in parallel, is, is, is how I understand it. Right. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, there's, there's an interesting trade-off between monad and, and applicative. Um, so we really need the monad as well. Uh, because sometimes, you, I mean, you want to fetch some data, you want to make some decision based on the data that you've just fetched, and then do something else. And the only way you can do that is, is with a monad. So the monad lets you bind the result to some computation and then do something based on the value of that result. Um, so then you get a sort of an interesting structure where you've got some applicative stuff going on and then a monad bind and then some more applicative stuff. Uh, and, and that lets you do some batching and then make a decision and then do some more batching. Mm -hmm. Um, but, yeah, so the, then the interesting question is, do you want the programmer to have to write that? You know, do, do you want the programmer to have to write explicitly all the applicative compositions and get them right? Or would you rather just teach people to write the do syntax? And given that the people writing this, this code are not likely to be Haskell experts, at least not initially, you know, we, we hope eventually they'll become Haskell experts. But <laughs> um, right now, you know, we, we will be teaching a lot of people to write well, F FXL programmers to write Haskell code um, in this very stylized sort of DSL. 
Um, and we'd rather not teach them the, the you know, nuances of how to use applicative composition and so on. Um, but the do syntax is quite natural. So what we'd really like to do is to be able to just teach people to write the do syntax and have the right thing happen. Uh, but it turns out to, to make that work, you need some special translation of the do syntax. So this is something that we've been looking into recently. Uh, is how we can translate the do syntax inside GHC. So this would be an extension to GHC. To have it, um, where possible, translate the do syntax into applicative composition. Uh, and then, you know, people can just write the do syntax. And if it turns into applicative, then that happens automatically under the hood for you. Uh, and otherwise, it doesn't. And hopefully, uh, the right thing happens. Uh, that sound, so it, sounds interesting. Sorry, Rain. I, I just wanted to jump in and say... Um, I'm sorry, you're breaking up. Oh, oh then, then I'll let Rain go ahead and tell my internet, <laughs> correct? The Simon is... When I, when I learned uh, originally uh, the type classes in Haskell, my my initial impression was that was that monad was was strictly more expressive than applicative, but I guess that's not the case. And is it because similar to how liftm is always fmap, but you can often write a more um, performant fmap for the functor instance? Is it is it the case that the applicative you get for free from from the monad instance can be replaced with a more expressive or powerful applicative for some applicatives? Well, so you're absolutely right that monad is more expressive than applicative because in applicative you you can't uh, change the the structure of the uh, of the rest of the computation based on a value that you got earlier on. So that's what monad lets you do. Um, but if you were to use well, you, you get the applicative for free from a monad. But if we were to use that in our system, we would get the wrong applicative instance. It, the, right. the power of, our, of what we've done is to. Uh, write a special applicative instance that does something mm. that you wouldn't get from the monad. Uh, so the the free applicative that you get isn't the one that you need to do to to, to structure this com this computation. That that's absolutely right. Yeah, and in, that's caused us some problems as well because a lot of the uh, the combinators we want to use like map m and filter m and so on are built using the monad composition, but we want the versions using applicative. Mm -hmm. um, so actually we have to write our own versions of, of map m and filter m and provide those by our own version of the prelude. So this actually raises an interesting question with the uh, the plan to, to reorganize the, the type class hierarchy. If applicative is a strict superclass of monad and then um, the applicative that you get for free from Monad isn't the one you 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 want to use. Does would that reorganization make things easier for you because you'd be specifying the applicative that the Monad would then derive its behavior from? Uh, well, so the reorganization is going to make things easier for us because things like uh, MapM and FilterM will work properly because they'll. Uh, I, I presume MapM will be the same as Traverse. I, I haven't looked at the details of the proposal at the moment, but. Um, Traverse is the thing that you want, and MapM is the monad version of that, and that's the one that we don't want. So I'm hoping that when the uh, the applicative monad proposal comes into effect, then MapM will be Traverse, and that's the thing that we want. And so similarly for FilterM. So you're sort of adding some some epicycles, some extra complexity to to deal with the inversion of 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 the hierarchy, or the fact that the applicative that you get is you don't get to specify the applicative uh, in a way that monad inherits that behavior right now. So you're doing extra work to make that happen. But if monad inherited its behavior from applicative, you would get that for free as you build the monad. Yes, that's right. Yes, yes. So it's certainly going to make things easier when applicative is a superclass of monad. And this has been kind of interesting to me because this is the first time I've really come across something that hurts because Applicative yeah. is not a C plus of monad. Yeah, I, I really like seeing these these data points from you know from real world or industrial use of Haskell to say yeah it seems like this proposal is going down the right track. We've got some data yeah. points to substantiate that now. Definitely, yeah. Uh, until now it was just you know I, I've got to write a bunch of applicative instances that I didn't yeah. have to write before. And <laughs> or <laughs> what it, am I gaining from it? it? It's wrong in a principled way, but maybe that's not actually bothering day to day Haskell programmers. But now it is, yeah. so that that seems good. Can, uh, I think we're finding more and more ways to use applicative, and uh, you know, that's good. Mm -hmm. If we can take a step back from, we, we've done a bit of a, of a deep dive into the, the technical uh, 
aspects of your work at Facebook. If we could take a step back and talk about some of the, the soft problems that you may have encountered introducing Haskell at Facebook. It sounds like Haskell had already been sort of primed for you when you got there through some, through some evangelism within the company. Can you maybe talk about any challenges that you face in, in or that, that you're aware of in introducing Haskell to a, a company like Facebook? Well, so I think it would be difficult to try and introduce Haskell into any of the the really big core technologies in in Facebook. I mean, well, talking specifics, we've we've got a huge PHP code base. That's no secret. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that that sometimes happens is that part of that code base gets split off into a new service in the back end, and there's a whole lot of these these uh, types of services. And the service that I'm working on is one of those things, in fact. Um, and those are typically implemented in C++. There's a lot of C++ code in the back end mm -hmm. of Facebook implementing various services. Um, so I think if you were to try to re-implement one of these major services in Haskell, that you probably wouldn't get much traction because there's a lot of, you know, it, it, there's a lot invested in those existing implementations. And you'd have to provide a pretty significant value proposition it, for moving to Haskell. Mm -hmm. You also have some organizational challenges, the second system effect, the you know, things like that that make a rewrite already a, a losing proposition to begin with. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but it just turned out that the um, th this FXL uh, opportunity ha had exactly the right kind of shape to it. Mm -hmm. um, that made Haskell a good solution. Yeah, you found a square-shaped uh, hole and you happened to have a square-shaped peg sitting around. It, exactly, exactly, yeah. Uh, but then, from this point, I think if we make a success of this project, then we'll have built a, a lot of infrastructure uh, in order to make it work. So we, we've had to build a lot of stuff that lets Haskell talk to all the other services inside Facebook. Uh, mm -hmm. And having built all that infrastructure and made nice APIs, then we can you know, go and shop this around and say, well, look, <laughs> we, we, can, we can write code really nicely against all these back-end services now. Is so there anything else we can use this for? What are you finding is the best way to do uh, interop with Haskell from other languages? Is it through some ubiquitous protocol like a message bus or TCP? Are, are you doing any FFI to Haskell? Yeah, in, uh, in our project, we're using the FFI to talk to C++ code to implement uh, the, the, the interaction with all these different back-end services, because we already have C++ code for the clients for all these things. Right, so you're doing some calling out from Haskell to client libraries to, to get Haskell integrated into your existing messaging system. Right, right, but that's not the only way to do it. Um, most of these services talk to each other using a thing called Thrift. So mm -hmm. Thrift is a, an open source uh, Apache uh, project that's somewhat like protocol buffers that Google yes. uses. Um, and the idea is that you write a, you write a description of your of the data structures that you want to to pass and the requests and the responses, um, and from that you can translate that into multiple languages. You can right. translate that into a client for C++, for Java, for Python, for Haskell as well, and also servers for all of those languages. Um, so this is a sort of language independent way that you can talk to services. Uh, and it turns out that the Haskell implementation isn't very good at the moment. <laughs> I haven't really tried it out in anger, but looking at it, <laughs> I, I think it could do with some um, some serious tuning. Um, but that's possibly a uh, a way that we could talk to all the other services without going via C++. Um, so that's something we might try in the future. So I'm I'm really interested in in how to introduce Haskell to organizations of various sizes with various architectural configurations. And I'm, I'm learning some lessons here that I think are interesting. Uh, this most recent one is that the tools that your language provides to interop with other languages, the, the interface points are, are very important to get right. If, for instance, your, your architecture uses Thrift and, and Haskell's Thrift uh, uh, package isn't very good, then no one's going to be incentivized to introduce Haskell there. So that's interesting. So, so Simon, you mentioned that the users and, and developers uh, using FXL uh, were not Haskellers, uh, and they probably are in the process of becoming Haskellers to some extent. And we heard something similar when talking to Don Stewart about uh, Haskell and Standard Charter. There's, there's more 
non-Haskell writers of Haskell than actual core Haskell developers. How many do you do you estimate are are actually core Haskell developers there, and how many uh, are using Haskell without exactly uh, knowing all the details? Right. So in our team at the moment, we have uh, three-ish, um, three to four people working full time on the the Haskell core service that we're writing, and uh, once this is implemented, there'll be I'm not sure of the exact number, it's sort of tens of, of developers writing the code that will, uh, they'll be writing code in the DSL that gets uh, run by this, this service. Um, so the, these people are called site integrity engineers. Mm -hmm. So it, it's their job to, uh, you know, to write the code that recognizes the spam and, and to uh, select the right machine learning models and that sort of thing. Um, so. There's, there's lots of code that sort of, uh, the code changes a lot. Mm -hmm. So every time some new spam attack happens, we have to write a rule to, to match it, and that rule gets pushed out to all the machines running this service. Uh, and they've all got to start running this new code very quickly. So that's caused us some challenges, actually, in uh, figuring out how we can compile this new Haskell code, push it out to all the machines, and have them dynamically loaded up and start running it very quickly. Yeah, I, I saw in your talk that you mentioned you had to write something to unload code at runtime for the sort of hot code swapping uh, using the linker. Is, is that going right. to be affected by the new changes uh, in GHC that seem to be trying to get rid of um, the linker in GHC and, and work more with the system linker? Yeah, so, uh, hmm. <laughs> so this has been sort of interesting because... Uh, we we wrote this linker a long time ago, and it and it's more or less a re-implementation of the of the system linkers on every platform. We've got um, an implementation of Elf linking, an implementation of uh, Cough linking on Windows, and you know Mac OS X as well. Mm. And you know it, it it doesn't seem like a great idea to have to re-implement all these linkers, right? Mm. Um, but it was the only way that we could load plain object files into GHCI. Mm. And it started off as something small. You know, you don't have to write very much to get it working the first time. And to make it work on a new platform, you've got to keep adding more code. And you know, before you know it, you've got 20,000 lines of <laughs> link. I'm, I'm not sure if it's that much, but it's too much anyway. Uh, so then we thought, well, can we use shared libraries? And for a long time, we didn't have shared library support in GHC because there were some technical difficulties with, uh, with interacting with shared libraries because it turns out that the shared library system on, on Linux has got some special support for C in there mm -hmm. um, that makes it quite difficult to use it for anything else. But there were ways around that and there was a very clever guy called Wolfgang Thaler who worked on this a while ago and he found ways around all of these uh, tricky technical problems. And we got shared library support but then it was quite a long time before it was actually ready for, uh, for real use and that only came in a couple of versions ago I think. Mm -hmm. um, but having got that now, we can say, well, let's use shared libraries for GHCI and make GHCI itself dynamically linked. And then um, we'll load in all the compiled code as shared libraries using the system linker. And we can throw away this linker that we've got in the runtime system, mm -hmm. which, which is great. Um, but then in the project of Facebook, we want to, well, we want to load in code dynamically. But uh, compiling code for dynamic linking has a small performance penalty, and you know I care about a few percent, <laughs> so uh, I'm not completely thrilled about that. And also, when you're pushing code to lots and lots of uh, machines on a on a network, using shared libraries is one more problem, right? You have to get all the versions of the shared libraries right and everything. So static code is is generally much easier, and you know if you find that in distributed back-end systems a lot, I think. People use statically linked binaries just because it's easier. You can push a binary out to, uh, to all of your machines and it will work the same on all of them. Mm -hmm. um, so for that reason, we wanted to go with static linking. And it, it's not really a, a fundamental decision. We could probably go back on this, but um, one of the things we want to do is, is unload code, of course. Once we've, you know, we, we've loaded a new version of the code into the binary, we need to eventually unload the old version of the code. And doing that with shared libraries is quite tricky. I think it might be possible, but um, I'm not sure exactly how to do it yet. 
but we could implement it in the runtime system linker without too much difficulty. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Rain? Uh, I'll see. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. So, <laughs> so you mentioned um, that you know Haskell doesn't doesn't really. Uh, it's kind of a, a non-starter to look at. Uh, replacing things before they've been moved out of the sort of monolithic PHP, you know, uh, front end side of things uh, into a back end service. And how many, how much has Haskell seen traction in that? Because what I've seen out of Facebook uh, was more on the sort of PHP static analysis and transformation side and less on the uh, production system side. But maybe we just haven't heard about uh, about those sort of systems. Right. I mean, um, there certainly isn't much traction for Haskell at the moment, apart from the project that I'm working on at Facebook. Um, but the, there are some some other uses of functional programming in the company. So uh, OCaml is is um, uh, is being used in a type system for PHP actually at Facebook. So this was announced quite recently. There's a type system called Hack. Mm -hmm. Uh, for PHP that's implemented in OCaml um, and it's used to type check the entire code base at Facebook. It's a gradual typing system so you don't have to uh, immediately make sure all your code type checks. You can gradually add types uh, and you know more and more checking happens as you add types. So it's a very nice system and they've made it work really fast because this is, the code base is huge and you've got to be able to incrementally type check everything as soon as you change some code without having a long delay. Um, so it's a very well designed t system. It, it integrates very smoothly into the existing PHP language, uh, and uh, and you know it's making developers more efficient. And do you think that uh, that your work on Haxel right now will continue for quite a while, or do you see yourself moving into different projects, uh, working with Haskell there and Facebook in, in possibly the near future? Uh, that's really hard to tell. So, I mean, right now it, it's uh, we're going full steam ahead on this project, and we expect to have it in production within the next few months, probably. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, you know, I'm, I'm sure there will be lots of cool stuff that we can do once we've got this in production. I think the the uh, site integrity engineers would benefit from lots of new tools that we can build for them using, uh, you know, the existing Haskell code base. And once we've got a nice language in place, we can then start building better abstractions for all the other kinds of things that they want to do. So I think there's going to be lots of spin-off projects. But then, you know, there's also the uh, the opportunity that we have, having built all of this infrastructure in Haskell now, that possibly we could find something else within the company to use it for. Um, so I, I don't know whether whether we'll find a good way to follow that up or not. No, I just can't tell yet. Uh, so, so what about um, seeing some Haskell uh, released as open source from Facebook? I know that uh, Facebook has an open source page, which probably is a, a, a small fraction of the code uh, there. Uh, but I think it would be uh, would be really quite fun to see some Haskell hit that that page at some point. Do you think that's likely to happen? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, so we've really designed the system that we're working on to make that possible, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a sort of core framework library uh, that's independent of all the other infrastructure. So we designed the system. Rather than having a, a framework that depends on all the data sources, we've reversed it the other way around. So we've got a framework that you can plug data sources into. Mm -hmm. and so that means, so we, we did that reason that way for several reasons. One is that um, it makes this core piece nice and self-contained and you can test it independently of everything else. Uh, you can open source it, which we intend to do. Mm -hmm. And you can also plug in versions of the data sources that don't actually talk to data sources. They're just mock data sources for testing. Um, so it, it just makes the whole system more flexible. You, could, you can plug, to, plug together pieces in, in different ways uh, and use that for testing. So yeah, going back to your question, we, we definitely intend to open source this framework. It's just a question of um, 
making sure that it really is independent of all the, the pieces that we don't want to export and um, figuring out the mechanics of exporting a bit of our source repository inside Facebook into an external, say, GitHub repository or something. Um, and other projects at Facebook have done this, so we, we probably just need to draw on the sort of expertise that they've uh, that they have in taking existing internal projects and making them open source. Interesting. So I found it interesting when you said you sort of stumbled on on FXL and and applying Haskell to it and coming up with with Haskells that uh, that it's also uh, quite related to concurrency, which you've been doing a lot of work on and, and your new book is about. Was that intentional or was it a happy uh, accident? In, in some ways it's a happy accident. In, in other ways it, it's kind of unfortunate because it's the, the first problem I come across in industry that needs concurrency and it's not covered in my book, which is a complete <laughs> disaster. <laughs> Well, this will be a good segue to your book. Please proceed. <laughs> so, so yeah, could you could you explain in a little bit more detail? That that sounds very uh, interesting. So, are you asking in what way is it not covered in the book? Or yes, basically. Well, so the the problem we have is one of implicit concurrency, and the book covers all of the explicit concurrency. Uh, programming models, basically that, in a nutshell, that's it. Um, I hadn't come across any problems that needed implicit concurrency in a way that you sort of, um, you write a monad and the operations within the monad can be reordered and performed concurrently behind your back. So this is a problem that I hadn't really come across uh, before I joined Facebook and it was just sort of an interesting um, interesting revelation that uh, <laughs> you know, this this sort of thing was needed. I foresee some new research papers in the future. <laughs> yeah. Yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So let's let's talk about the book then for a while. Uh, the, the the book covers uh, a number of different parallelism and concurrency paradigms, uh, and it, it, you do a good job of exploring the foundations of each. It, it seems to me, uh, as I read the book, that Haskell has a lot of low-level ways to uh, write code for these paradigms, and we are starting to build up from those some higher-level abstractions. Do you think that's a correct statement, or, or am I missing some higher-level tools for that? No, I think that's probably right. I think we've um, we've struggled to find the right way to express parallelism, and the conclusion we've more or less come to is that there isn't one single right way to write parallelism. Uh, I mean, of, of course, there's the data parallelism in the style of Repr and DPH and so on. Uh, is clearly different from the kind of parallelism that you see in, in strategies and uh, and the par monad. Mm -hmm. um, but to choose between strategies and the par monad, that, that's not so clear. Uh, it, it's not obvious which one of those you should choose for any given problem. And I, th I think we sort of struggled for a while when we had strategies and there were various problems. We couldn't figure out, you know, what, what's the best way to teach programmers to use strategies. And there are sort of various problems uh, related to not understanding when things are evaluated and, and programmers having to try different ways to insert their pars and seeks to, to make the parallelism happen in the right way. Um, so that sort of led us to the idea of the par monad. And the, the par monad, you know, is a bit more explicit because it, it lets you say exactly what the granularity and the dependencies are between your computations and lets you build up this nice data flow graph implicitly it, by the, the par monad code. Uh, it, se it seems like the par monad is a very, a very nice uh, tool set for working with deterministic parallelism. And I, yes. I've seen... Uh, a, a few a few attempts to build higher level abstractions like Lindsay Cooper's uh, Elvars project, Elvish, which uses IORFs and uh, PAR to build up uh, concurrent um, or at least parallel data structures that are essentially um, commutative. It, 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 does it seem like that's the way things are going to be happening for that form that that paradigm that we're going to use things like PAR and then move up the abstraction chain to, to more expressive or more powerful uh, abstractions? 
Yes, I, I think that's, that's probably right. Uh, I mean, one of the things I would like to see is, is something like the Parmonad on top of Cloud Haskell so that you can write Parmonad like expressions, you know, on, on top of uh, a framework that, that runs your computation across multiple machines, not just on the same machine. Mm -hmm. um, of course, then, then you have to deal with, with the network. <laughs> You you may you may be forced uh, to live in this slightly messier world of non-deterministic parallelism at that point. But there there may yeah. Yes yes. So so something else is interesting is that the um, the par monad has a par io variant. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think this was Ryan Newton's idea, and I hadn't realized how important it was until I tried to write some parallel io code uh, in one of the chapters in my book. So there's there's a chapter where I I sort of describe how you use concurrency for parallelism. And go through this example of the of searching a file system, and it turns out the best solution to that particular problem was to use the I/O variant of the par monad, uh, which gives you all the benefits of the the magic scheduling that's going on under the hood. It gives you this nice API on the top with a monad and just you know I vars that you use to communicate the uh, values between the various computations. Another thing that I noticed while reading your book is that. Are we we can we can target the uh, the GHC's parallel runtime pretty effectively at a low level uh, with things like PAR, but in, in terms of effective control over granularity and, and the efficiencies, the trade-offs there, it seems like we, we only have some some sort of ad hoc tools for that right now. We can specify spark sizes in sort of heuristic or ad hoc ways. Is is there a more uh, a more principled approach to, to getting good efficiencies around you know spark based parallelism in the future mm, well the the trouble with sparks is they're very implicit right you you have to spark something that's a thunk and then you have no control over its size or its dependencies because that's just something that's implicit in in how you wrote your code right but in terms of the generation of those sparks you you, you discuss various ways for sizing sparks Based on the type of workload and the, you know the, the number of tasks, and but my impression was that those were, were relatively ad hoc. You can say, based on the number of cores I have and the size of this list, generate this many sparks and things like that. Right, right. I mean that that certainly is a problem with um, with the normal way that we use sparks. I mean, you typically have to pick chunk sizes appropriately, or if you're using par buffer, you have to pick an appropriate buffer size. I don't think enough experimentation has been done with doing that kind of thing on a dynamic basis based on the number of cores. I mean, that, that's certainly an avenue that, that uh, ought to be explored. It's something I didn't get around to doing. Um, it seems like... Sorts sure. of ideas Go ahead, sorry. along the lines of having, um, having lists that have a spark at the end of them where you can where the spark generates some more parallelism, you know, and it sort of automatically generates more parallelism as you as you walk down the list. And there are sort of structures you can build like that, which, uh, w which work more dynamically than just picking in a, a fixed buffer size. The, the, the GHC parallelism runtime, as I understand it, is, is a work stealing model based on a, a heap of sparks. Is that, is that a correct characterization? Yes, the, the Spark implementation is based on work stealing. Yeah, it, it's a traditional double-ended work stealing queue. and each core tries to steal from all the other cores, um, mm -hmm. but the the deck size is fixed. It's fixed at, at runtime. So there's a, a command line flag you can do to, to select the deck size. But when when the deck fills up, you've got a choice: do you throw away the the most recent one, or do you throw away the, right. the oldest one? And you know that <laughs> some sometimes it works best to throw away the youngest one. Sometimes it works best to throw away the oldest one. I, I read a recent paper about a dynamic size deck. And it looked very interesting, and I know Edward Komet has done some work to implement a, a library that, that provides that data structure. Is that something that GHC might consider replacing their current DEC implementation with? Would that provide any, any advantages? Uh, sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, as I was saying, when the deck fills up, right, you have to throw away some parallelism. And uh, deciding which parallelism to throw away is a really hard problem, we, and the runtime can't make that decision in a sensible way. Mm -hmm. uh, so certainly having a, a dynamically sized deck would be a good idea. Um, it's a tremendously difficult thing to implement. So I, <laughs> I remember 
working on this this thing. It was written actually by um, Jos Berthold, first of all. He did an internship at uh, Microsoft. And he wrote the first implementation. I think it had a bug in it that I had to find subsequently, and it turned out to be a missing memory barrier You know that I only found by uh, lots of experimentation and uh, staring very hard at 20 lines of code for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these things are fiendishly difficult to get right. H having messed a little bit with the uh, Haskell implementation of that dynamic uh, deck, it seems like they're really easy to implement when you don't care about what happens when either side empties, and then they're really hard to, to get. Right, right. Really hard to get to, to, to steal from either side and repopulate the empty side. Yeah. And, yep. and, and I got to that point, and I just sort of threw up my hands and said, I'm going to let Edward. Uh, solve this problem for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but yes, I mean, to answer your question, I'd definitely be open to to changing that implementation, especially if somebody came along with a piece of code that we can try. Mm -hmm. So that, that leads me to another question that I've had. Uh, since since you left GHC, you, you must have, have, have felt that the, the the people available to work on GHC and the direction of the project was you know, robust enough to tolerate that sort of of uh, process failure of your you know, you're leaving the team. What what's your plan for your involvement with GXC in the future? And, and do you have any any thoughts about the what's going to happen internally with GXC and especially in the parallel runtime in the future? Yeah, and so I, I think it's actually been really interesting the the surge in contributors since uh, since I left. I think it you know the, the we ought to draw a graph of this. There's probably been an uptick in the amount of con contribution. Um, so personally, I'm still trying to keep my, my finger in the pie a bit. I'm, I'm uh, working on GHC a little bit of my time uh, just to make sure that important bug fixes happen and uh, reviewing people's code uh, when necessary and so on. Um, so over time, I mean, obviously, I'd, I think it would be great if people got involved in the runtime. I have to confess to being slightly scared about <laughs> other people making too many changes to the runtime because I know just how difficult it is to make changes and uh, and to find all the bugs that tend to arise. You know, this is a very hostile programming environment, and we're writing C code completely untyped, and often when you get bugs, they only reproduce when you're running on a certain number of cores, and they're not reproducible and I have all these tricks for finding bugs that involve writing assertions all over the place and doing sanity checking and um, running things hundreds of times and poking in the core dump and so on. Um, so it, it's a very challenging environment to write code. And uh, while I'd like to encourage people to go in and, and get involved, certainly, I, um, we have to be very careful about changing certain parts of the system, especially things like the garbage collector and the, the handling of black holes and, and various tricky parts like that. Um, but having said that, there are there are certain parts of the runtime where that's not so much of a problem. You know, we we could do with a good overhaul of the flag handling, for example, and that's not very deep code at all. Um, so yeah, there, there are certain places where people can get involved. And if you look at some of the work that that Edward Yang has done, for example, he's really got involved and he's he's modifying some of the uh, the scheduler and the garbage collector and so on. So it is possible for somebody else to wade in and get involved. I, I can't help but re be reminded of uh, Simon Payton Jones talking about thinking of GHC as his child, and and hearing you talk about uh, the deep parts of the runtime system, uh, it's like uh, it's your child, and it's it's just got its license to drive, and it's going out on the Los Angeles freeways where it's it's very dangerous. <laughs> so, right, right. Um, I, I I'd like to go back to. Uh, parallelism, and actually to concurrency uh, for a moment, and uh, ask you a question about STM. And there was a lot of there was a lot of interest about STM. I remember a few years ago, and I don't know if it's died down uh, or or not, or if it just hasn't found applications. I remember writing um, a high performance concurrent server, and I wrote the first version in STM and found out that it was just a little bit too slow, and switched to use uh, atomic. Uh, uh, atomic operations instead. Is that something you've you've seen, or uh, you know that STM is being used in practice? Or has, uh, I'm just curious um, what you think about it. 
Right, yeah. I mean, so I think STM is being used in practice a lot mm -hmm. um, because of its uh, its abstraction benefits. So the, there's some really important benefits you get from STM. Uh, things like being able to wait for multiple things, being able to wait for arbitrary conditions, and compositionality in general. You know, it, these are really huge benefits that you get when when building concurrent code. Uh, so it you know it, it's so attractive that people just use it. Mm -hmm. And they're willing to prevent to uh, pay the performance cost. Yeah. yeah. But I, I think there is a lot of low-hanging fruit that we haven't really looked at at all in terms of performance of STM code. And um, there's certainly been a lot of research in the community. There's quite a big uh, research community around STM in other languages. But nobody has looked at that in the context of Haskell's implementation of STM. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of low-hanging fruit we could do, you know, um, Looking at scheduling of, of transactions, uh, I think, if I recall correctly, one of the things they found in the context of uh, languages like C is that sometimes you really want to just back off and do full-scale, um, large-scale locking rather than uh, trying to overlap um, atomic operations, transactions. Mm -hmm. uh, so, th I mean, that kind of thing, I think, would probably yield some, some benefits quite quickly if people were to look into it. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit there. And and now going back again to, to Facebook, uh, I, I've heard some stuff about concurrency there, uh, but what about on the, the, the parallel side of things? What about uh, where Facebook has uh, a lot of this data that they're using Hadoop and HDFS and they just published about uh, Presto, their new uh, SQL-like language. Do you see some potential there for uh, for Haskell for for large data. Yeah, um, so I, I I think there's a potential project there that uh, I mean th this is a, a huge project, but you you could imagine doing a, a language solution to the problem of queries against this uh, huge amount of data. Mm -hmm. um, and various people have looked at this. So the uh, Dryad Link from Microsoft is one example of this. You, you have a sort of language that is a DSL that compiles into something that runs on multiple machines and it's optimized for building the right structure of, uh, of distributed computation to get the data and you know, do the joins in the right places and so on. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think it would be really great to build a sort of functional version of that kind of thing uh, that runs across a cluster. And I, I think it would give you more more leverage than what you get with the sort of things that you can do with Hive. So Hive lets you write SQL queries, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of limited. And it can only do, and Hadoop can only do MapReduce. So you've got a very limited structure, both at the language level and the distributed computation level, uh, of what you can do. So I think having a language that let you express more at that level would be really good. Um, but you know, this is sort of a, a, a vague, <laughs> a vague idea at this stage. But um, interesting. Yes, yes, we could do that. Well, a lot of a lot of the problems in that space involve, you know, the big data problems involve uh, high performance networking and I/O. Do you, do you feel like the new I/O subsystem that, that's introduced into upcoming GHC is going to open any new doors for Haskell in terms of the, the problems that, that it can solve that are that require that level of I/O performance. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's it certainly opened the door to doing uh, to scaling web services, which is the primary use for you know doing a, a multi-threaded server type application. Um, but you know, we, we could certainly use that at Facebook for writing services in Haskell. You know, if we were to write a, a thrift server uh, and fork one thread per request using the new IO manager, it ought to scale quite nicely as long as we've done everything else right. Um, so that's something, certainly something I'd really like to experiment with and uh, would probably lead to doing a nice efficient implementation of a thrift server, for example. Um, so, uh, yeah, certainly. I mean, I, I think this will probably unlock lots of, uh, lots of ways that people want to write services in Haskell and have them automatically scale very nicely to, to lots of cores. Getting back to introducing Haskell into architectures that, that don't include Haskell, 
it, it seems to me that there are, are two big wins for Haskell. One is taking a performance system written in a, a relatively uh, unexpressive language like C and, and maintaining the performance but increasing the expressiveness. And another might be doing the opposite, which is taking a very expressive language like Ruby that is not very performant and increasing the performance while maintaining the expressiveness. Has one of those been more successful than the other, or is there are there other options that I haven't included for you at Facebook? Uh, hmm. Yes, yeah, so I think Haskell has not really been used as a as a language to increase the performance of a, a higher level language very much at all. Uh, we much more often see Haskell used on top of some lower level C libraries. I mean that's uh, that's certainly much more common. In the system that we're working on at, uh, at Facebook, we have C++ on the outside implementing the server parts of the system, and then it calls into Haskell in the middle, and then we've got C++ at the bottom as well. And uh, So, I mean, this is probably something that you don't see very often at all, right? So uh, we, we've got Haskell providing a few foreign exports at the top, and then we've got lots of, uh, lots of complicated FFI code at the bottom calling out to lots of different C++ libraries. And we're regularly pulling out the middle chunk and replacing it with a new version of the middle chunk. <laughs> so it's, this is all. It seems like Haskell is, is well suited now for that confluence of performance expressive, expressiveness and safety, and for for writing business logic. So you, you're essentially implementing a, a, a unit of business logic in Haskell with adapters at the top and the bottom in C++. Yeah. Uh, and do you find that, that using Haskell for the, the business logic uh, lets you ship features more quickly? What kind of uh, extrinsic benefits are you getting you know, in terms of business benefits? Yeah. Um, so I, I think for various reasons, Haskell is, is a good choice here. I think, uh, well, so one of the things I said is that we want to push code very quickly uh, to respond to various you know, external attacks and so on. Um, so we don't get a lot of chance to test the code before it gets pushed to all these machines running the service. And if you make a mistake there, you can take down thousands of machines and, uh, and all of a sudden this service isn't running anymore and lots of things go wrong. Um, so we want to catch as many bugs up front as we can, and the type system really helps there. So that's one of the reasons we want to be strongly typed. And um, Haskell is giving some benefit over FXL because FXL just had integers and strings and JSON, and we can give a lot more type structure to the uh, to the structures that we're working with, and catch more bugs. Uh, and then, of course, being purely functional is a big improvement as well because it, uh, you know, uh, we just have no side side effects lurking around to uh, to make things go wrong. Um, but then the the problems that it leaves are problems of performance. So we need to make sure that we're not pushing any code that's going to severely impact the performance of the system uh, and hence you know, make the system unresponsive in another way. So we, we can't just throw away all the testing. We just have to be careful about making sure that we're testing performance properly um, before we push out code to all the machines. What kind of performance testing do you do, you do there? Well, so we haven't got to this stage yet, so um, I think imagine what we will do is to do sort of end-to-end -end, uh, testing of uh, of the code against some sample data that we've um, we've collected. Uh, yeah, it, it's hard to tell. So yeah, we'll probably do some profiling of the Haskell code and, and let users see where most of the the execution time is going, uh, and let them try and find out whether there's any uh, serious problems being introduced by the code they're writing. So this is actually um, reminding me of something else that we're doing at the moment, which is to uh, to do some kind of stack tracing on production code. So one of the problems with Haskell has been that we have no stack traces, right? When something goes wrong, uh, you do a head of nil or something and you get no stack trace. So I've been working on this, I was working on this at Microsoft. Uh, to from one end actually to give you a, a useful looking stack trace in the profiling system because it turns out to get a useful stack trace you need to maintain uh, a side by side view of the stack uh, separate from the execution stack um, 
so I was working on this and GHC implements this in the, the profiling system. Um, but that adds some overhead. So you don't want to run with profiling on all the time in production. And so the other way of attacking this problem is to say, well, we won't change the runtime at all. We'll just use the existing runtime and don't try and maintain a separate stack. Uh, and when something goes wrong, we'll try and make some sense out of the execution stack. And um, so Peter Wharton, who's a student at Leeds University, has done quite a lot of work on this in his PhD. He's been working on propagating source information from the source program right the way through the compiler to the back end in such a way that you can map program counters at runtime back to source locations. And he has this working in ThreadScope, so you can click on a on a bit of a ThreadScope profile and it will show you which bit of Haskell source code was being executed at that time. Um, and we can also use that for giving stack traces. So when something goes wrong, we can dump the execution stack, we can walk up the execution stack and we look at each of those addresses on the stack and we can say which bit of Haskell source code was being executed for each of those stack frames. And even though you know, the stack frame will look strange because it's lazy evaluation and the ex execution jumps all over the place, you, we should be able to get some information about where the program was uh, when something goes wrong. So that's what we're working on right now. There's um, Peter Wartman and uh, Arash uh, Rouhani, who's at uh, Chalmers University. He's doing a master's on this as well. Uh, so the three of us are working right now on uh, making this um, making this work. We've got various patches that Peter has ready for inclusion. We're sort of working on getting those into GAC. And then working on the programmer API. Uh, so there's two aspects. One aspect is can you get a stack trace in GDB if the program goes wrong? And that, that kind of works. Uh, and the other aspect is what does the Haskell programmer see? Can they get a stack trace? If you throw a, a head of nil, can you capture the stack, store it in the exception, and then print it out later? So there's some questions about what the Haskell API should look like, and we're sort of working on that at the moment. When you say the stack, my limited understanding of the runtime is that Haskell doesn't maintain a call stack, per se, that it, that it has an execution stack. So when you talk about the stack, are you referring to that execution stack? Is that correct? It's the execution stack, right. <clears throat> it, it's not the, the call stack that you, uh, you expect in a traditional imperative language. Um, Although it does have stack frames that look similar, most of those stack frames are missing because of tail calls, and there's some extra stack frames in there due to lazy evaluation. So the, the structure is you know, probably not what you were expecting looking at your source code, but it has some clues in there. And yeah. This actually, if I can digress for just a moment, there's a question that I have been wanting a, a definitive answer to for a while in, in the Haskell runtime, which is, how do tail calls work? If there's no if there's no call stack, there's no there, there's no stack to eliminate by optimization. So what is happening when Haskell encounters a, a tail call? Well, there is a stack. I mean, the execution stack is the stack. Uh, it's just that when you make a tail call, we don't push a new frame on the stack. We just take the arguments and jump to the address for the function. Right, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to veto any more so talk about, that ab about that since we're gonna run out of time if we go if we go into that. I'd love to talk about it. <laughs> no, but, no, that that's a, that's an acceptable answer. It's just it's been bugging me for literally years that I don't understand how tail calls work in Haskell, and that is enough for me for now. <laughs> so, um, Simon, th this is actually very exciting to hear about with with uh, stack traces because. Um, I see that as, as extremely important in getting Haskell deployed, uh, especially at a large scale where, you're, where your code is running on hundreds or thousands of servers. You know you're going to run into exceptional situations sooner or later, and you have to find what happened there. Uh, so that, that's really exciting to hear, and I, I, I'm looking forward to that pushing uh, forward the state of the art. Um, yeah, yeah, me too. So let's step back from writing Haskell for a minute to writing a book. What, what prompted you to write this book? Did you get, just get contacted uh, by O'Reilly, or were you thinking about writing this for a while? Um, it, it kind of grew. So um, I did a, a summer school in 2011. I taught a summer school on parallel and concurrent programming in Haskell. Uh, there was a few lectures, and I had to write a... Uh, um, well, I, I wrote up some notes to go with the lecture course, and it was about 
50 pages, I think the limit was at the time, and I kept on writing, and I had about 70 pages by the end of it. Uh, and that was quite good. And I could have gone on a lot further, I realised at the time. So then I was lucky, again, the following year, to be invited to do another summer school. Um, and it was a longer lecture course this time. So it was a week's worth of lectures. Uh, and I expanded my notes that I had from the previous year, so, so I ended up with about 100 pages worth of notes this time. Um, and then at that point, I, I thought, well, I, I must have about half a book, right? So <laughs> why don't I just carry on and write it? And various people were were encouraging me to do that. There was um, uh, there's a course at Chalmers University on parallel functional programming where I gave a lecture, and uh, and uh, the people running that course were uh, were saying they really needed a book to draw from. Um, so that sort of encouraged me towards writing a book. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it sort of felt like I had a good head start. So um, I contacted O'Reilly and said, would they be interested in writing this book? And they were very keen on the idea. Uh, and I set myself a deadline of a year in advance and, uh, and set to work writing. And it took longer than I thought. So anybody that's thinking about writing a book, it takes longer than you think. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, I, I can uh, recommend from from reading what I have of your book. It's it's not just about uh, parallelism and concurrency. You get to uh, see a lot of. Uh, I like how you included the profiling and looking at the performance of of these programs. Uh, and aside from that, you get to see uh, a Haskell master at work writing writing code and seeing. You get to see it. Get built up, and I, I can see your thought process going through this this program, uh, which was extremely valuable. Well, that's something that I really wanted to get across. I think was not just to to write a book that um, was a reference guide to the various APIs that we have in Haskell, but I wanted to write a book that had some real examples in it that worked, and you know, to focus on the APIs that we have that you can write. Um, real programs in you can use for writing production code and to, to try and demonstrate that and the hardest part was really finding some examples that were you know real enough to to be credible but not not too real you know not too complex so that they would obscure the ideas and uh, hopefully the examples that I found you know fall somewhere into the the right uh, the right sort of space there. Mm -hmm. So having having uh, written this book and had some some success with it, will we be seeing more Haskell books from you in the future? Because that would be wonderful. <laughs> Not any time soon, I don't think. <laughs> Maybe a little bit too busy at Facebook. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't really say, it, but yeah, not any time soon. I, I think you might be the third guest that we've somehow asked to write a book on Haskell performance. Uh, yes, please do. <laughs> I, I, it's it's going to happen eventually. I know that there will be a book that comes out specifically for uh, for performance because I think that's something right. Right. Uh, we will learn. I think you could you could take Don Stewart's Stack Overflow answers and edit them a bit and then publish that. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Rain, do you have anything uh, else you want to cover? I I'm good. I, I think we're doing great on time. Should we so, should we start to wrap this up? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Simon, we've asked you a lot of questions, and uh, is there anything that you wanted to talk about uh, that's, that you've been working on or that you've seen that's interesting, something that we haven't uh, paid attention to right now that, that uh, related to Haskell? Uh, so, I, I think you probably haven't covered standardization at all in any of your podcasts so far. Oh, let's do. So I, I'm not actually involved in the standardization anymore, but I just wanted to uh, say that I, I think it's important that we should carry on doing the standardization effort in the language. And it's been sort of hard to find people that have the time and, and are willing to put the effort into uh, to standardize the language features. And you know, we, we sort of made a small step with Haskell 2010, but I think we need to carry on making these small steps and, and kind of uh, expand the baseline of what we consider to be the standard Haskell language. So you're, refer you you're referring to Haskell Prime here. I think there's Haskell 2014 yeah. is, is slated to 
to come out? Right, right. So I mean, it, it's good to see that we've got a committee working on Haskell 2014. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, there's, there's really sort of two reasons to do this. One reason is that we get to really work out all the details of these extensions that we've been throwing into GHC and, and you know, make sure they make sense in the context of the language. And the other reason is that other people can come along and implement Haskell. And I, I really think that's a good thing. We don't have enough competition mm -hmm. in GHC. And part of the problem is that we're running away too fast and these people can't, can't catch up. It's a really big language now. So standardization yeah. is really important. So I'd I just like to, uh, you know, <laughs> encourage people that are interested in doing that to get involved. We've seen some issues with extensions in GHC interacting with, with each other in interesting ways because of, there's a sort of a combinatorial problem of testing each possible interaction with an extension and all other, the set of, you know, power set of all possible extensions interacting in different ways. Yep. It, that, that sounds difficult to, to deal with, especially as easy as, as it is. It, it's a feature of GHC that it's so easy to add extensions, but it also seems that without sort of a rigorous analysis of, of the interactions between them that we could end up in, in various strange edge cases. Do you see that? The part part of the role of the standardization to analyze the extensions, figure out which ones to pour into the Haskell language proper, and is that part of what you would like to see happen? Right, right. I mean, the, there's a lot of extensions that haven't changed for a long time and are very well understood at this point. Things like multi-parameter type classes, and uh, you know, there's, a, there's a bunch of small language uh, type system extensions like that that we could throw in, um, and we could really raise the bar just by taking all these well understood um, long standing extensions and really nailing them down you know writing a, a good specification of what they actually mean uh, so I suppose one problem with with the Haskell standard is that we don't have any rigorous specification at the moment of, of, of what it means there was no semantics um, but merely the, the the act of writing it down writing the syntax down and trying to describe in some uh, in, in precise language how the feature works and how it interacts with the other features in the language. You know, it re really makes some of these details uh, fall out and, and you have to deal with them. Yeah, well, GHC may have a competition uh, in the form of, uh, there was something recently posted about AJHC, I believe, and Android. Uh, so, so maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is an interesting project, but I haven't really looked into it in any detail. Uh, JHC is a very interesting compiler. So it compiles to plain C, um, and it had the goal of having a very minimal runtime. Mm -hmm. So the, the the code coming out of JHC looks like sensible C code to, to some extent. And then I think the probably the sticking point there is how do you integrate the garbage collector? I'm not sure what the the current state of affairs there is. I believe there's some kind of garbage collector, um, but uh, having a, a minimal compiler like that with a minimal runtime means that you can more easily run it on embedded platforms, and that seems to be what AJHC has done uh, to run on Android. So, and you can run GHC on Android too, but it's uh, you know it's quite a difficult porting you, job. You were speaking earlier about some of the implicit complexities of, of the GHC runtime around the work stealing deck and, and various other scary sort of here be dragons places with, with a Formal specification for Haskell 2014, the, 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 essentially the Haskell that we're all programming in today, and that making it easier for new compilers to come about. I'm I'm reminded of the the small talk uh, design, which is to do as little as possible in C, do everything else in small talk. Uh, is, is there a way that you could get that? design of a Haskell compiler where you have a small kernel and then you're, you're writing as much of the Haskell compiler in Haskell as possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you might be surprised to uh, to hear that that was one of our goals, actually, <laughs> to, to write as little as possible in the runtime. And yet we ended up writing a whole scheduler and, you know, the, the garbage collector is very complex as well. Um, some of these things really are hard to move into Haskell and we've made a couple of serious attempts at, at moving the scheduler in particular into Haskell. And so the, there are some sticking points. One is, the, is lazy evaluation. 
know, if you write a scheduler in Haskell, what happens if it if it blocks, <laughs> right? Because in in lazy evaluation in a concurrent language, one thread can block on a lazy computation that's being evaluated by another thread. Uh, so what happens if your scheduler gets blocked on something that's being evaluated by another thread? You know, you can't run the scheduler anymore. Um, so that's that's a difficult problem, and the, there are solutions to it, but they're complicated. And um, so we, we did find a nice way in the most recent attempt. So this is by um, uh, Casey, who did a, an internship at uh, Microsoft, and Simon Payton Jones and myself. Um, we have a draft paper about this. And we found a nice way to um, to find a small API between the scheduler and and the runtime. And the small API just lets a, a thread block and unblock again. Um, and that lets you express pretty much everything we've got. So you can write MVARs in Haskell, and you can do, uh, and you can write complex schedulers in Haskell, and so on. Um, but the the performance is is a problem. If you uh, so every time you need to switch threads, you've got to run some Haskell code, and it has to do various manipulations of Haskell data structures and so on. And the up calls and down calls between the runtime and and the Haskell code turn out to be quite expensive. So we haven't found a way to really get close to the performance of the existing runtime while letting you write a scheduler in Haskell. And now for me, that's the problem. I, I don't want to impose a large performance penalty on people just to get a bit of generality and a bit of uh, nice cleanliness in the way that we write schedulers. Well, Simon, uh, I think we're just about out of time here. Uh, Rain, is there any last, uh, last question or comment you want to make? No, I was just going to wait till the end and then plug his book again because it's amazing and everyone should read it. Yeah, why, why don't you do that so we can edit in a nice, a nice plug? <laughs> ah, well, I will do that as soon as I look it up and find out the exact title <laughs> and, and whatnot. <laughs> this is totally the part where we're going to be editing things. Oh no, this 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 will go in the uncut cut version. Oh, also, uh, what is uh, Simon? What's the plan for the book? Is currently freely available online. Is that a permanent thing? Is that a temporary thing? What's what's the plan there? Yeah, so it was always my uh, my intention to have it freely available under a Creative Commons license, and I got O'Reilly to agree to this as well, um, in the same way that Real World Haskell is as well. So it is actually a CC license. The version online at the moment is not the CC license version. Okay. Uh, but if, I mean, it, it sort of happened by accident. O'Reilly said, shall we put this online? Because they had this new service called Atlas that they wanted to, to put a few books up online. Uh, mm -hmm. And they put it up online, and they haven't taken it down yet. <laughs> so <laughs> if they ever take it down, then I'll put the CC license version up. Okay, that's great. But, but yeah. right now, they, they have a nice hosting system. I've, I've had a hit or miss experience with, with, with books published online, and the formatting of, of the book on, in Atlas is, is quite nice. It's, I think it's it is, yes. Yeah. So the, the book in question, of course, is Parallel and Concurrent Programming in Haskell by Simon Marlowe. And you should all read it because it's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Simon, for taking the time to talk with us. It sounds like uh, there was enough left there at the end that we might have to bring you back on again in the future and talk about uh, <laughs> uh, all the, uh, the research going into implicit parallelism or concurrency rather and uh, stack traces and so on so thanks for joining us i'd be happy to. okay you've been listening to the haskell cast episode four recorded on november 17th 2013 with guest simon marlowe for links and comments on this episode including including a link to simon's book go to www.haskellcast.com <laughs>